The Honourable Philip Edmund. And I would uh, just remind members that this is the member's inaugural speech and the usual courtesies need to be um, adhered to. The Honourable Phil Edmund. Mr President, as I stand to speak in this chamber for the first time, let me begin by congratulating both you in your election of, as President of the House and the Chair of Committees in his election. The performance of this chamber depends heavily on these positions and I'm confident that we'll all benefit from the skills and experience that both of you bring to these roles. I'd also like to thank the Clerk of the House and his parliamentary staff for helping introduce all the new members to the workings of Parliament. Your help has been invaluable. Furthermore, I'd also like to take a moment to congratulate those members who, like me, are also giving their maiden speech. I can appreciate the hard work that everybody has put in and I look forward working with all of you. While it is customary that a maiden speech focus on the member and their background, I prefer to start with some of our state's history because we tend to forget in such beautiful surroundings of the vision, hard work and determination that our forefathers gave to bring us to where we are today. Notwithstanding the history of the first Australians, Western Australia's road to colonisation began in 1827 when Captain Stirling's exploration of the Swan River area, which drove him to argue for the establishment of a colony for free settlers, as opposed to the penal colonies of the East. Backed by a favourable botanical report and a desire by the British to prevent French colonisation, Stirling won support to start the new colony. Much to the dismay of Stirling, the requirements of other colonies at the time meant that British support for the colony was insufficient. Despite this, and a lack of land and coastal charts for the Swan River area, the five-month voyage was taken from, uh, from England was taken, and on the 1st of June 1829, the West Australian coast was sighted from the HMS Parmelia, a moment which we celebrate every year on Foundation Day. While we can appreciate the natural beauty seen by the first settlers, it would be hard for us to relate to the hardships they faced. It was only emergency supplies from outside and the constant search for farmable land that starved, saved many from starvation. Apart from getting enough food, the clearing of land and the building of shelter were also challenges. Today, some members may agonise over having to share offices in Parliament House, but we should take comfort in knowing that, unlike Stirling, the roofs in our offices do not leak and our newspapers are delivered because back then the local new, uh, newspaper was nailed to a eucalyptus tree on St George's Terrace. Hard times saw many settlers leave the colony, but those that stayed on did so because they had a vision that they believed in and the courage to carry that vision through. My family history in Western Australia began in 1948, when my grandparents, David and Cynthia Rayside, immigrated to Australia. Like many at the time who arrived with no family or friends, they considered themselves a pioneering couple. Soon after arrival, my grandfather began working for Westrail, and during his career he saw many changes as WA grew through the second half of the 20th century. Working as the Assistant District Engineer in Kalgoorlie, he saw the final days of steam and helped receive the first diesel loco to Kalgoorlie. After this, he worked in Geraldton as district engineer when Sir Charles Court was Minister for Industrial Development. It was during this time that Western Mining hauled its first shipment of iron ore from its Midwest operations to the Geraldton port. Liaising between government and the resource companies of the time, he oversaw the laying of new tracks and several upgrades where existing tracks could not handle the ore trains. The heavier axle loads caused many, caused many problems and moving forward was not easy nor without its own challenges. Beyond his work, my grandfather was a keen contributor to the community, an attribute that has been passed from one generation to another. Despite his demanding career, he gave up much of his own time to sit on the WA Bushfires Board, be an active member of St Vincent de Paul and the Knights of the Southern Cross. In short, he loved this state and its people. My parents, who I'm blessed to have with me today, were also strong believers in contributing to the community. My father, who ran a financial services business, was a member of JC's International 
and was a district governor for the Salvation Army Red Shield Appeal in 1984. My mother, who started her own counselling practice in 1994, helped out in the school tuck shop, did Meals on Wheels and volunteered on the Samaritan Helpline. Educated in Perth, my upbringing instilled in me the principles of reward for effort and giving to the community. My brother Mark and I earned our pocket money doing chores. We learnt to save the things that we wanted and were taught to care for what we had. And I recall Mark and I spending our Christmas holidays helping out on Father Brian Morrison's Christmas appeal, collecting and distributing gifts for the needy. All through my school years, I had a strong desire to one day own and run my own business, just like both my parents. I wanted to be my own boss. Consequently, I left school early to enter into apprenticeship as a cabinet maker, and in May 1991, just nine months after finishing my apprenticeship, I started my own cabinet making business. Since then, 18 years as a small business owner has made me very aware of the issues small business face. And it's a privilege to be a member of the Liberal Party, which works so hard for small business. Having been an apprentice, I'm proud to say that I've personally employed several apprentices, with some now owning their own businesses and competing directly with my own. Although becoming an MLC has led me to place the business under management, it continues to take on apprentices with all the staff living in the South Metropolitan region. Although being a small business owner is a large part of my life, it was a terrible storm that hit Rockingham in May 2003 that started me towards a life in politics. That night I saw many boats lose their moorings to then being pushed onto the foreshore. And that event reinforced my view and that of many others that a marina was badly needed for Rockingham and the government needed to act. After six months of lobbying government for the construction of a new marina and six months of disappointing responses from elsewhere, I travelled to Canberra to meet with the then Prime Minister John Howard, as only he and the Liberal Party had shown any interest in building this much needed community facility. It was encouraging to finally meet people who appreciated the needs of our community and who saw the need for government involvement. Five months later, I became a member of the Liberal Party and in 2004 stood for the federal seat of Brand, achieving a 15.9 per cent primary vote gain and making Brand a marginal seat. My desire to see more amenities and service come into our region remains strong and in February 2005 I successfully ran for the council seat of Safety Bay in the city of Rockingham. During my four years as a councillor in the city of Rockingham, many things were accomplished. However, the most memorable achievements were helping to obtain $6.7 million in federal Auslink funding for the Mundijong Road extension and being at the opening of both the Gary Holland Community Centre and the Lark Hill Sporting Complex after personally sourcing regional part uh, partnership funding from Canberra. Being involved in bringing more amenities and infrastructure to our region and just seeing how much government could do inspired me to run for office again. And thanks to those in support of my electorate, I am here today. Having spoken about this state's history and my own, it's now time to speak in the future I'd like to see for our state. We all know how lucky we are to live in Western Australia, but having such a large state with such natural beauty and plentiful resources should not be taken for granted and should not stop us from seeing the many problems that still need fixing and the many opportunities that still are out there. No government was ever elected to simply administer everything, change nothing and hope for the best. Governments are elected to make, these, to make things better, to make a difference, and to do this we must be innovative. Not all the opportunities for innovation are obvious. Often the best ideas are the ones that take society by surprise, forcing us to accept that there is a better way. To be able to identify, develop and act on the kind of ideas that have throughout history pushed society forward, you need vision, imagination and creativity. It was, for example, vision, imagination and creativity that saw the first settlers through. It was also vision, imagination and creativity that helped our resources sector to grow into what it is today. But the need to push forward is never ending. Technologies change, markets change and humanity changes. And if we do not respond, if we simply sit back, we risk being left behind. In recent times we have been reminded of just how volatile resource markets can be. We have seen the fallout of dropping prices and we have seen many people lose their jobs as a consequence. And the lesson from all of this is that even though the resource sector has contributed so much to Western Australia, it still has to deal with local and overseas markets and economies 
of, of which all are beyond our control. To date, we have done the right thing by working in partnership with the private sector and responsibly developing our resources. And although I'm a great believer in our resources sector and its ongoing importance to the state, we must become more than our resources. We must be more than we are today. As a government, we can do this by working with industry and the community to make this state a place where things happen, a place where people from all over the world want to visit. This is where tourism can tell us just how attractive our state really is. Because when people plan their holidays, our state is compared with the rest of the world. And the reality is that we need to offer a more diverse experience to visitors than we currently do. In speaking on tourism, I refer to the recently released Jackson Report, which highlights the many issues faced by the tourism industry. For example, the tourism industry depends heavily on external infrastructure, which means that before tourism businesses even get to see their customers, those customers have already been experiencing Western Australia, which makes infrastructure such as our ports, roads, airports and parking very important. We should be particularly aware of our airports and realise that we are a long haul destination for most inbound tourists and that their first and last experience of Western Australia are often had at our airports. And how good or bad these experiences are can have a strong impact on a tourist's lasting impression of our state, no matter how good we have performed in other areas. It is a harsh reality for our tourism industry that the external infrastructure they depend on is often developed and maintained by all three levels of government. Often the involvement of the private sector, which makes getting the necessary infrastructure for tourism so much harder. Even if infrastructure is not an issue, high quality tourism operations by nature require exceptional locations if they are to succeed. Development applications must tackle not only founded and unfounded community fears of inappropriate development, but excessive red tape, which also means expensive and frustrating battles with complex planning requirements and regulations. Large scale developments need to deal not only with all three levels of government, but all multiple agencies across those governments, creating costly and unnecessary overlapping, which can block the investment of our tourism industry needs. With this in mind, we must recognise that our world is so interconnected and that, that if we become a state where ideas are held back by bureaucracy and red tape, then the biggest barrier to innovation and creativity is the government itself. Then our creativity and vision will go elsewhere. Where will they go? They will go where government does not resist change, but rather embraces it. And unless we provide fertile soil for these ideas to grow in, then those ideas will benefit other communities grow other economies and provide new jobs for other workers. I'm glad to say that this government is responding and ensuring that we are a better place for the future, no matter what it holds. Moving to a more local focus, my desire for the electorate I represent is for the communities of the South Metropolitan Region to be whole communities, where people can live complete lives within their local area, without having to go to Perth for basics such as education, job opportunities and health treatment. This is not saying that we need a second capital city, but rather we should provide for the needs of everyone, no matter where they live, because we're not a government for the select few, we're a government for all Western Australians. As a member of the Legislative Council, I cannot claim that we will fix every problem faced by society, nor that we won't make mistakes, but I can say that when potential and vision come together, we, like our forefathers, with their vision of a new colony, and Sir Charles Court with his vision for the state's resource sector, we will nurture that vision with hard work, determination and unshakable belief that what we are doing is both possible to achieve and a worthy legacy for our children to inherit. I would now like to take a moment to thank some of the many people who have helped me over the years, providing me with advice, support and encouragement. Although not everyone is mentioned, you know who you are and how much your support is appreciated. I thank Rick Palmer, Tony O'Leary and Les Dodd for their help in brand. Barry Samuels, Chris Thompson and the late Gary Holland, who I work with on the Rockingham Council. And some of my many friends from the Liberal Party, John Corsa, Nick Rawlins, Phil Turtle, Donna Gordon and Frank Parker for all their help. I'd also like to thank the 500 Club for their ongoing support to the West Australian Liberal Party your contribution often goes unrecognised. I'd also like to thank and congratulate some other important uh, people, namely the members of the South Metropolitan team. 
and the Legislative Council when joined by the Honourable Simon O'Brien, the Honourable Nick Garan, and in the Legislative Assembly, the Honourable Christian Porter and Bateman, who I believe is one of the best Attorney Generals this state has ever seen, Mr Joe Francis in Jandicott, Dr Mike Nahan in Riverton, Mr Peter Abetz in Southern River and John McGrath in South Perth. It is a privilege to be part of this hard-working team and to be part of the Barnett Government. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge those who are closest to my heart. I'd like to acknowledge my mother and father who brought me into this world. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge my wife Virginia and my newborn son Matthew. You are the closest to me and it is often your love and support that keep me going when I need it most. Having acknowledged those who have supported me in life and in politics, I recognise that my presence in this chamber today is ultimately due to the trust and support that the people of the South Metropolitan Region have given me. Mr President, in conclusion, the South Metropolitan Region is a great place where I am proud to live, work and raise my family in. But it is more than just a place. It is a community of which our team in the South Metropolitan Region is part of, and we will be making, working hard not only for the South Metropolitan Region, but to make Western Australia a better place to live. Thank you.